good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be in this session and I would like, although I'm formally co-organizer of this session together with Law, Martin and Holland, I must say that it's truly Martin and Holland and Law who have carried the bulk of the organization and I'm very happy to take part in this um, in this um, session dealing with uh, resources which I think has an incredibly interesting array of papers which hopefully will be reflected in a publication that will appeal to a wide uh, audience of uh, readers. Well, the, the first of uh, two papers that I'm going to contribute uh, to uh, in this session is uh, titled Waterscapes in Antequera, Spain, Exploring the Role of Water Resources in Settlement Patterns, Monumentality and Connectivity. Water as a resource is uh, something that uh, usually does not leave um, uh, strong archaeological traces in itself. But we can, of course, uh, as archaeologists, study the uh, traces of hydraulic technology and with a little bit of luck maybe also uh, gather historical information or epigraphic information that refers to the use of water resources in a given region. Personally, I have never um, attempted to study the importance of uh, water resources in the region where I work, which is basically southern Spain, but a recent discovery has uh, given us the opportunity, actually and has put us in the, uh, in the position to, to start um, a research dealing with um, the use of water resources in the past. So what I'm going to be uh, presenting here is not um, a finished project with conclusions, but more like the setting for a research that we hope will be advancing in the next uh, few years and will help us understand well, what the title of this uh, paper says, basically. So this, uh, this uh, study uh, uh, starts from a particular archaeological discovery that was made in 2005 at the Antequera Dolmens site. Uh, Antequera in Malaga in southern Spain is home to perhaps one of the largest uh, megalithic uh, sites in Iberia with two major uh, late Neolithic monuments Menga and Viera, and one major Copper Age uh, monument, uh, the El Romeral Tholos. These three monuments, perhaps especially Menga and El Romeral, uh, count themselves among the largest in Iberia and also the most um, impressive in their architectural design and um, in their um, form. These three monuments are um, together with two natural monuments have been listed by UNESCO in the World Heritage List two years ago. Uh, the natural monuments are two natural formations, El Torcal, which you can see there. It's a karst, a karstic landscape that has um, plenty of evidence of occupation since the early Neolithic in the region and is connected with the, with the megalithic monuments. And then La Peña de los Enamorados, which you can see in this picture, which is a, a very interesting mountain an archaeological site in itself that apart from its archaeology has um, a very conspicuous kind of a feature that makes it very uh, very noticeable which is this um, uh, anthro strongly anthropomorphic silhouette so when you look at this mountain uh, at sunrise or sunset what you see basically is a human face standing up uh, looking up so this may have been noticed, I suspect, we suspect, must have been noticed by Neolithic inhabitants uh, of this region and possibly earlier because there is a strong connection between this mountain and one of the megalithic monuments, Menga, which is the one I will be referring the most uh, uh, to. So Menga, quickly, um, Menga is a dolmen <coughs> um, uh, which uh, was... Um, well, it, it's difficult to say that it was discovered because Menga, which was erected possibly in the, in the first uh, three or four centuries of the fourth millennium BC, we don't have a very precise chronology, but uh, uh, what we have suggests that uh, time horizon uh, was never forgotten. So it, it never um, went out of use. It's, it's been used constantly since the, early, the, the, the late Neolithic. 
and therefore it's it's maybe not so accurate to say that it was discovered okay but uh, the, the first academic studies in the 1840s uh, led to Menga becoming one of the most prominent megalithic monuments in Europe uh, and it became somehow famous so in 19 in 1878 as you can see in that quote uh, Jean Destien uh, claimed that um, it it's the most beautiful and perfect of the known dolmens, or much later, a hundred years later, Glyn Daniel, the British archaeologist, claimed that Antequera and its dolmens should be ranked with Gavrinis in Brittany, in France, or Newgrange in Ireland, and Stonehenge and Avebury in England, and Mace Howe in Scotland, and of some of the great wonders of the Neolithic world. So, we have a major Neolithic site here. Okay, I will not go into too many details about the description of Menga as a megalithic monument. You can see some photos that I will pass uh, rather quickly to give you an idea. This is uh, some uh, cartography from a laser scan that was uh, carried out some 12 years ago. And that it's important, of course, uh, uh, to understand the architecture, the details. But also in case something catastrophic happens, um, God forbids, but uh, that is a record. So you can see some photos. It's basically a single chamber monument with massive stones. Uh, the stones of Menga combined together weighed some uh, more than 800 uh, tons, metric tons. To give you an idea, this is the equivalent of two really big airplanes, two you know, jumbo planes, fully loaded with uh, fuel, passengers, and luggage, one on top of each other, right? Two of these planes this is how much the stone in this monument weighs. The largest of these stones, which is the capstone at the back of the chamber, weighs 150 tons, which is, makes it a huge stone. So, I mean, the, only the feat of moving these stones and placing them uh, in this monument was obviously something major at the time in, in the late Neolithic. And must, have, must have made this monument incredibly famous in the region. And, uh, uh, we you can suspect that this fame is correlated with the fact that the monument has never gone out of use and has always been used, as I will show in a minute. So you can see here some photos of Menga uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a late Neolithic dolmen. Right, so in 2005, this is the mound. I will not dwell in details. Well, some uh, pictures are showing that um, the fact that it's a, me a monument with an incredibly long biography that spans from the late Neolithic to the early uh, 20th century. So from, you know, uh, polished hand axes uh, to Roman pottery, uh, uh, Roman tombs that have been found on the mound outside, uh, early medieval tombs that have been found outside the atrium of this monument, <clears throat> uh, early modern Spanish coins uh, to uh, Spanish Civil War bullets that uh, uh, we found at the atrium because uh, perhaps you know this is the latest uh, episode in this long biography it was actually pretty sad but uh, some people were shot dead there during the early days of the spanish civil war in 1936 so the archaeological record of this monument is an incredible mixture of things that go you know cover all of the past six thousand years basically so in 2005 uh, a totally unexpected discovery was made in this monument because there was no record of this. And this discovery was basically a water well. This water well was found at the back of the chamber behind the first pillar. And it's a very remarkable feature in itself. It's uh, almost 20 meters deep. It go uh, one and a half meters across. And therefore, it's like more or less a perfect cylinder, although it's not so cylindrical at the base, it becomes more like a truncated cone, but still it's basically a cylinder cut in the bedrock. It goes all the way to the water table, which is 20 meters down there, and it provides uh, drinking water. It provides good water. Um, the infill of this uh, feature of this uh, water well, uh, when it was excavated, it was fully backfilled. So to see this, we had to excavate it, right? Included several skeletons of animals and a lot of material culture. So in itself, the infill of this shaft is a very uh, challenging archeological uh, record that we are studying now. Um, you can see the process of excavation of this shaft. 
uh, how it was uh, challenging in terms of security and uh, not um, obviously not very nice to be down there, you know, and um, pre pretty claustrophobic. Um, so these pictures give you the idea, I think, uh, all the way down to the water table where water filtrates from the walls naturally. So as I said, it's a, it's a very good quality water resource because it provides drinking water all year round which is important in a region that is ba basically Mediterranean basin and therefore is subject to the cycles of uh, yearly uh, seasonal uh, aridity and drought and also as a region that is prone to longer droughts. So you can see here a little bit of an idea of all the finds. We still haven't studied all these finds, but it's mostly modern material. So to cut the story short, what we know, I'll, I'll skip this and come back now, we look at the C14 chronology of the animal bones in, in this infill, and it, it has provided a very uh, precise chronology for the formation of this infill. So basically, we know that the water well was backfilled very probably deliberately in the 18th century AD, because all the C14 dates, as you can see in the diagram, are incredibly consistent. So somebody took the trouble of bringing uh, what in fact is the equivalent of something like six uh, dump trucks, you know. Uh, obviously there were no trucks in the 18th century, so somebody had to carry this, you know, in buckets or whatever, or with wheelbarrows and backfill this thing. Why did something, someone, why did anyone anything like this? Well, that's another problem I'm not going to go into, but um, some other day, or perhaps in the discussion if you want, we, I, I can present my uh, thinking about this. So the water well was killed or backfilled in the 18th century for some reason, but the fact remains, you know, that water well had been there possibly for a long time, but how long? We don't know when the well was made, was built, because there is no hard evidence to date it. But if we look at the material culture associated to the well, we see some interesting things. For example, outside in the 2005 excavation, a Roman tubulus, which is a Roman water pipe, was found. Is that a coincidence? Because it's not a common find, you may correct me, but not a common find in my experience to find a Roman pipe in a Neolithic dolmen. So <laughs> what were the Romans doing there with pipes? Well, if the water was in use, perhaps the pipe makes sense, right? Well, something like this happens with other bits of evidence. Like, for example, there is evidence of some Andalusian cantaras of the 8th to 13th centuries AD and late medieval flasks, which were used to carry liquids in the 15th century AD, or these modern alcarrazas water jars used uh, throughout the 16th and 17th centuries that have been found outside the dolmen and inside the dolmen. Uh, particularly is interesting this Alcarrazas type water jar because we see them in some uh, uh, Baroque Spanish paintings of the 17th and 18th centuries. Like for example, this one by uh, Zurbarán, uh, which is a still, uh, um, still dead, what do you call it in, in English? Um, Bodegón? Still life, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. A still life uh, with pots or this very famous painting by Velázquez, uh, El Aguador, which in Spanish means the water carrier. Obviously, in, at that time in Spain and in most of Euro Europe, houses did not have running water, so there were people carrying water in big jars and then selling it, right? So you see, this is, um, again, something that makes us suspect the, the water well had been induced long before it was two minutes. Okay, I'm really behind. Okay, so this um, uh, provides the background, as I said, for a number of questions. Why is there such a major hydrological feature in such a major megalithic monument? And at that point, it's interesting to see, to expand the picture and to look at the region. And one feature of the Antequera region it, is that it has a lot of salty water. So finding uh, fresh water, drinking water, is not that easy. Because, I mean, and this map shows the toponymy of the region. There's lots of uh, site names and places in this region that are called Arroyo Salado, which is in Spanish would mean salty brook, 
or La Laguna Salada, the Salty Lake, for example. You know, uh, many names like this, which are indirect proof of this. So the water of the well, as I said, it's pretty uh, drinkable. I've drunk it and I didn't get sick. Uh, <laughs> And also, uh, it's interesting to notice that um, in this region, precisely because of the abundance of salty waters, salt has been a major resource, at least since, since antiquity. We have references to the exploitation of salt from this site, Fuente de Piedra, uh, stony uh, source or stony spring in Spanish, um, uh, with uh, inscriptions referring to the exploitation of salt. And there's also evidence of the exploitation of this uh, resource since the Neolithic at this other site, Fuente Camacho, which is, has been in use until recently. In addition to this, um, it's important to note that there's evidence of um, sanctuaries uh, devoted to healing waters or even sacred waters all the way at least to the uh, pre-Roman period. So in the, in the third and second centuries BC, this uh, site, Nescania, some 15 kilometers from uh, the Antequera dolmens, uh, uh, had this ancient water sanctuary with strong association to aquatic deities connected with fertility and healing. So there are interesting precedents of um, a famous place bringing people in from uh, a wider region because the waters were famous for his real or imagined healing powers. Uh, the same applies to this other site at Fuente de Piedra, which in the 16th century became very famous. In this book, Las Antigüedades de las Ciudades de España, The an uh, Antiquities of uh, Spain's Cities, by Ambrosio de Morales in 1575, he claims that the best of all of Spain's springs seem to be that of Antequera, due to its strength against the terrible disease of kidney stone. Well, as you know, before, basically before the 20th century, uh, medicine relied a lot on magic and, you know, things like placebo effect and so on. So places with good quality water could become very, very important. In fact, the Fuente de Piedra water in the 16th century was exported to the Spanish overseas colonies of the time, including the Americas and Southern Italy, as it was so famous, with certification issued by the local authorities to prevent fraud, so that the water was certified with its origins, okay? So, wo uh, Menga water well versus waterscapes, and I'm finishing um, some observations and ideas, as I said, uh, to lay out our uh, forthcoming and ongoing research on this site. Iberia's largest megalithic monument, Mega Menga, is associated to a remarkable hydraulic feature like no other, a water well. There are subtle indications that Menga's water well may have been in use for a long time, perhaps since antiquity, per perhaps also even earlier. Oops, this is out of place. The Antequera region, the location and characteristic of Menga's well suggest this was no ordinary water well, but perhaps one with religious or symbolic connotations. Was it a healing water or sacred water well? There's one single fact that makes you actually think this. Um, instead of digging 20 meters to reach the water table, barely 100 meters further from the hill where the monument was built, you only have to dig three meters to get to the water, right? So these people chose to dig 20 meters to get the water. The Antequera region presents a potent history of water sanctuaries, famous healing waters and salty waters that have contributed to the region's connectivity at least from antiquity, but possibly earlier. In a region with plenty of salty water, fresh water has been of particular importance, determining settlement patterns and land control, with some fresh water springs being celebrated as sacred. So the making of the Menga water well and its subsequent history must be seen in light of the powerful waterscapes of this region. Thank you. Thank you.